Okay, good evening and welcome to another installment of our uh, College of Humanities and Social Sciences Dean's Lecture Series. I'm Brent Carbajal, I'm the Dean of, of the College and, and it's my pleasure to, uh, to have you all here. Um, as you might know, this is a series, a community series of lectures that's sponsored um, by our college and the Dean's Fund for Excellence. If you are interested in uh, engagement with the college or the university generally, we'll have some information outside that you can uh, avail yourself of and, and, and a list that, to which you could add your contact information. Uh, uh, this is uh, an important uh, event that we do once a quarter. Uh, we try to find uh, um, not only excellent examples of the, of the quality uh, and important research that our faculty does, but, but things that are important to the community. So I think tonight will be, be no exception. I want to acknowledge our partners with the city uh, and uh, uh, the use of this uh, nice facility and also uh, Bellingham TV 10, uh, the uh, uh, channel on which you'll be able to see uh, Professor Lois's talk uh, for the next couple of weeks, um, I think. Um, and we will also have it on our, on our website and on our Facebook uh, and a number of other uh, places. Um, one little housekeeping item before I, I introduce our speaker. Um, we will have time for questions afterwards. Um, because this is recorded and televised, we ask that before you ask a question that um, you wait for the microphone. Um, Associate Dean Martin will, will uh, try to get the microphone to you as quickly as possible. If you're up there, the microphone's right in the corner. But uh, on, on TV, it'll be kind of strange if, if uh, Professor Lewis responds to a question that nobody out there in TV land hears. So, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jen Lois, Professor of Sociology here at Western. Having taken her undergraduate degree at Dartmouth College and her PhD at the University of Colorado, Professor Lois has been at Western since the year 2000. A passionate and popular teacher, nationally recognized researcher and scholar, and engaged community member, Professor Lois was promoted to the rank of full professor this last fall. For her first book, entitled Heroic Efforts, published by New York University Press in 2003, she spent six years studying a volunteer mountain environment search and rescue group and became interested in gender, heroism, and the sociology of emotions. That book was honored in 2006 with the Outstanding Recent Contribution Award from the American Sociological Association. Tonight, Professor Lois will talk with us about issues, topics, and themes explored in her most recent book, Home is Where the School Is, right here, also published by NYUP, in which she focuses on motherhood, emotions, and time. With an estimated 1.5 million American children being homeschooled today, there's no question that our topic is timely and important. I think you'll enjoy Professor Lois's examination of the issue, and at this point, having dispensed with my responsibilities and and I will be quiet and pass the microphone to Professor Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks to Dean Carbajal for having me here today, and thanks to the city of Bellingham for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to talk about my research out in the real world, where it comes from. I don't always get to do that, so that's nice. Um, so I spent about a decade studying homeschooling mothers. Um, not the children, just the mothers. And uh, it finally culminated after a very long time in the book that you see up there, uh, which just came out in December. So the, um, the kind of the angle of the book is that our ideas about mothering sort of overlap with the practice of homeschooling. Um, and I study sociology of gender and sociology of emotions primarily. And so that's sort of the, um, the take of the book. Um, so I don't think you need to homeschool or have experience homeschooling to sort of relate to some of the things I'm going to talk about today. All right, let's see. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my research. I am a field researcher, I think I wrote that down, um, which means that instead of analyzing numerical data and making sort of, you know, wide scale conclusions about large scale social trends, I uh, interview people in depth for you know, a couple hours at a time, and I take field notes of my observations when I hang out with people who are doing interesting things like mountain search and rescue or homeschooling. Um, so although my data are not generalizable to the larger population, the trade-off with field research is that you can um, get an in-depth look at a smaller group of people 
You can allow people to speak for themselves because they speak for a couple of hours at a time, and you can allow them to contextualize their own lives. And so um, that's the kind of data and research that I do. Um, let's see. When I first moved here in 2000, the, everyone I met in the first two weeks either homeschooled their kids or knew someone who homeschooled their kids. And I had never met anyone who even knew anyone who was homeschooled. I think that's changed now, but you know, 15 years ago, 13 years ago, that was a different story. So um, I thought that was a super interesting opportunity. Uh, there wasn't a lot in sociology on homeschooling, and so I decided to study it. Um, for those of you who don't know, homeschooling, people who homeschool their kids can do all of their kids' education. Um, they can send their kids to public or private school for one or two classes if they want to. They can co-op with other homeschooling families to get the, you know, the academic information that they need. Um, and they can even, now it's becoming more popular, work with a public school system who provides a liaison teacher. Most districts do now, in this area anyway. And the, the liaison teacher will you know, sort of go back and forth between the school district and the homeschooling families and provide advice and curricula, however it's designed in that particular um, school district. So there's a really a very many ways to homeschool. There's not just one way to homeschool. Um, now, I have not. Sorry. OK, let me talk a little bit about this. So um, everyone I met in the first few uh, weeks homeschooled their kids. Uh, so I decided to do 24 in-depth interviews with uh, homeschooling mothers. Now, I did not have kids at the time. I do now. That's a whole other story about how becoming a mother allowed me to relate to homeschoolers differently, understand mothering differently. But at the time, I did not. So I, uh, I talked to these mothers in 2001 and 2002 um, just about their experiences homeschooling. Um, my kids are school age now, by the way, and they go to public school. So although I don't have personal experience homeschooling, um, I do have these data. I also took field notes of different events that I attended that were related to homeschooling. So I went to several statewide conventions about homeschooling. I went to many parent support groups, meetings about homeschooling. Um, I went to lots of websites. And I took notes of my observations and those kinds of things uh, with respect to that. Uh, let's see. Then I had kids. Then I wrote a couple of papers. And then there was kind of a lag in the production of their research for a while. And when I tried to think about putting the book together as sort of a larger project, I decided it was time to go back and do some follow-up interviews. Because six or seven years had gone by since I originally talked to these people. And I thought that was um, that's a big chunk of a child's life and a family's life when children are growing. So in 2008, to 2009, I did 16 follow-up interviews with the all the original participants that I could find. I was able to find 16, and they all agreed to speak to me in these follow-up interviews. Um, so the data I'm going to talk about today come from both of those time periods. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, 16, or the 24 people that I interviewed originally. Um, 21 of my sample participants identified as Christian, 14 of them as either politically conservative or evangelical Christian. The remaining didn't either uh, detail their degree of their faith or they uh, identified as like progressive Christian or Catholics for social justice or some kind of thing like that. Only three of my interviewees told me that they were not at all religious. My sample was fairly white, 21 white families, two Hispanic American and one African American family. I spoke to only mothers, although four husbands did sit in with their wives on the interviews. So do have a little data, interview data from them. All, well, almost all of the families I interviewed were two parent heterosexual families. Um, one mother was engaged. She was a single mother engaged to be married, so she was sort of heading toward that heterosexual family model. And one of my interviewees was a grandmother who homeschooled her grandson whose father was single. So it was her son and her son's son, and they lived together, and she kind of took on a lot of the maternal role stuff anyway. Um, the range of children in the families that I talked to was from 1 to 12, so there was quite a big range. And as far as these other demographic characteristics are concerned, um, most parents were in their 30s to 40s. Most parents were middle class. There was a little bit of diversity there. Most mothers had four-year college degrees. Only two worked outside the home. One mother was the single mother who um, worked at a homeschool co-op office that her son attended, and she worked part-time. And then the other mother who worked outside the home worked nights and weekends in retail. And there was a, quite a range with how structured these families were with their um, 
pedagogical approach. So you can put desks in your basement and have blackboards and the American flag and the whole nine yards of a replicated school. Or you can do unschooling, which is very unstructured and you just make schooling part of your everyday life and everything in between. So there's quite a variety of ways that people homeschool. So when we look nationally at the homeschooling population, it's very difficult to get accurate statistics. Part of this is because homeschoolers don't always declare themselves, so there is no list from which to draw a representative sample. Um, another problem is that homeschool laws and criteria vary greatly across state. So I could be do some, doing something here in Washington that is illegal in some other state. So I'm a homeschooling here, you know, but I'm a criminal somewhere else. So there is no sort of national um, way to figure out what's really going on in the homeschooling population. But we have ways to estimate, and our best estimate is that roughly 1.5 million kids are homeschooled. Um, which is about 3% of the population. Some numbers, some estimates are higher. It depends on what you look at. Um, people think, outsiders, non-homeschoolers, think that homeschoolers are this very limited, monolithic kind of group, when actually there is diversity in the homeschooling population. So people of all races homeschool, people of all faith orientations, people of all sexual orientations, people of all social class homeschool. Um, you can have lots of children, a few children, you can use any pedagogical approach, so there is diversity in the homeschooling uh, community, in the population. One of the places where there is quite a bit of homogeneity, however, is in family structure. And so what we are very likely to see in homeschooling families, though not always, is a two-parent heterosexual family with a mother who stays at home out of the workforce and a father who is the sole wage and earner in the paid labor force. Now that's not to say that dads can't homeschool, that moms can't work, that a single parent can't homeschool, because homeschooling does happen in all kinds of family con configurations. But we do see that this is a very common uh, setup, probably because homeschooling is a lot of work. And when you add it to the work of a family, it's much easier to accomplish when one person can devote uh, you know, the lion's share of the work to that, be devoted to it full time. Because women are more likely to leave the paid labor force when children are born than men are, we end up seeing this family structure in a lot of homeschooling families. And so this is a very common thing. And this was true nationally, and it was true in my sample as well. Um, let's see. So my research focus, uh, like five minutes into the homeschool, I attended one meeting. Five minutes in, I was like, this is about family. This is not about education. It's about education, sure. But this is a decision that families make about how they want their family to be. And so education is part of that. Because there's so many women doing it, women in the trenches and that kind of thing, for me, homeschooling is a mothering issue. And so that is the take that um, my research uh, approaches this with. As I talked to homeschooling mothers, they discussed their experiences in terms of two main themes. One, maybe because I'm a sociology of emotions sociologist, is emotions. Um, so mothers talked about their decision to homeschool in very emotional terms. They talked about defending themselves against outsiders who see them in the grocery store in the middle of the day and say, what, no school? Or they say, you homeschool? What about socialization? There's a lot of criticism aimed at homeschoolers, and they become very adept at defending that. But there are sort of uh, emotional consequences to that. So I talk a little bit about that. Those are two of the chapters in my book. And then I saw this other theme sort of coming in. And it was the theme of time. And time conflicts with emotions. At least that's how my data showed it. And so I have several chapters devoted to this. One is how homeschoolers sort of tame the vast domestic load that is involved in homeschooling, how they quantify time and try to find how to do it all. Another is a uh, lot of mothers were telling me they sacrifice personal time. They have no me time, as they called it. And so that became a whole other issue that I examined. And then these three topics are the things I asked homeschoolers about generally in the follow-up interviews. Look back since I last talked to you. How has your homeschooling journey you know, evolved? How do you know your children are successful? What sort of measures are you using? Which I did not judge. I just asked them, right? I have no expertise in that. Um, and then I asked them about their plans for the future. So that's the way time kind of came in. Each of these things then is a chapter as well. <clears throat> Whoopsie. So what I'm going to talk about today are these yellow areas. I'm going to try to touch on those things um, just to give you an idea, sort of the overall um, perspective of the book, I guess. The main thesis of the book 
is that emotions and time influence how homeschoolers see themselves as mothers. So they influence mothers' um, identities as mothers. So let's talk a little bit about the sociology of mothering. In 1996, Sharon Hayes, who's a sociologist, did, uh, decided to look at the evolution of our standards of good mothering over the 20th century. And so she started uh, looking at child rearing advice manuals and she saw a really big change in what we consider to be good parenting, right? So you should do this and then 10 years later you should be doing something else. Um, she also talked to individual mothers and interviewed them at that time and they were able to sort of talk about their experiences and their thoughts about what it means to be a good mother. What she found is that over time, our standards for what it means to be a good mother have intensified greatly over the 20th century. And so she started to kind of deconstruct that. And she discovered that there are three elements to the ideology of intensive mothering, which is the mainstream standard for good mothering in our culture. The first is this belief that mothers are the best primary caregiver for the children, that they are better than other relatives, that they are better than paid caregivers, and that they are better even than fathers. Now, individual people may, you know, argue with this or disagree with this situationally or overall, but as a mainstream culture, those are our messages, that the mother is the best caregiver. The second piece of the ideology of intensive mothering is this belief that children are priceless. And I, I always have to laugh because it sounds kind of unthinkable to suggest otherwise. Like when I think about my children, absolutely, they are priceless. However, if you think about this sociologically, across history, when we look, we have not always defined children in this way. When you look at other cultures, not all other cultures have this assumption about children. And when you define children in a particular way, it has implications for how you define what it means to parent them appropriately. So our definitions of good mothering are based on this assumption, which is very deeply entrenched in our society and is a very truly experienced thing, right? But it does vary across culture and has varied across time, and it affects how we define good mothering. So those are two pieces. The third piece of the ideology of intensive mothering is that good mothering is child-centered, expert-guided, emotionally absorbing, labor-intensive, and financially expensive. This is where we start to see the ratcheting up of the standards and the demands for what constitutes good mothering. We can see that these messages exist when we look at mothers who maybe don't take their child's needs before their own. They're selfish, right? Um, if they disregard experts' advice, which homeschoolers know something about because, you know, experts are people who say, your children need to be in school, right? Um, so there's a very real threat that you might be perceived as irresponsible if you do that. Um, mothers who are, emo are not emotionally absorbed maybe are like detached and you know not properly engaged with their kids, they're not putting in the labor, they're lazy, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, right? So there are very real ways that we criticize mothers who do not live up to these intensive standards. Um, so that's kind of the idea of the sociology of intensive mothering. We see that these messages are everywhere. They're in how we interact with each other. They're in medical recommendations for child rearing. They're in the media, these messages about what it means. Um, they are in schools, in the teachers and administrators' assumptions about what we should be doing at home with our children to be good mothers. And so we see that these messages really are uh, ubiquitous. We also see, and Sharon Hayes found this in her research, that the standards are so high, no one really can achieve them. And so it's pretty much inevitable that we will fail. But yet we live in this constant state of anxiety that we're not doing enough because the standards are so high. Other cultures are not like this. I don't know if you've read um, that book, Perfect Madness. I want to say it's Judith Warner who wrote it. But she sort of compares the mothering standards in France to the mothering standards in the United States and says, wow, we're kind of out of control. Um, so that's an interesting read. So these standards really inspire a great deal of anxiety about failure. Now I'm going to share with you quickly an um, experience of mine. I have this very well-meaning relative who gifted me a subscription to a parenting magazine. And when you spend your days locked in your office critiquing the you know, ridiculous standards of the culture of intensive mothering, this is not the gift for you, okay? <laughs> So it comes in the mail, and I can't avoid it, and I try to like take it from my mailbox and put it in the recycling without even reading the like little headlines on the cover, right? Because I know I'm, gonna, I'm already failing if I'm reading like how to make owl cupcakes. Oh my god, I didn't make the owl cupcakes. So, um, <laughs> so I try to just recycle it right away. Well, one day in a moment of weakness, I open the darn thing up, and I see this. Okay, it's just an advertisement for Juicy Juice, but it says, you check his helmet, you check his training wheels, 
shouldn't you be checking the label on his juice? I, I, uh, I get heart palpitations reading this because I think, oh my gosh, high fructose corn syrup is as dangerous as traumatic brain injury. I'm a terrible mother, you know? So in case there's any doubt that this ad is really playing on that sense of anxiety, that sense of failure, the sense of guilt, right? If you read down here this red copy, it says Juicy Juice, the very best juice for the very best kids because, of course, we want the very best kids. And if we don't do everything in our power to achieve the very best kids, we are failures. That is the implication. It's not you check the label on the juice. It's the assumption that you're not doing it. And you should be. So anyway, I feel like that's like emotional blackmail. I feel like these messages really tap our emotions. And interestingly, no sociologists have really looked at the emotions of motherhood. So I call this the emotional culture of motherhood. Um, Parenting is second by second, one of the emotion, most emotional things you can do. We're experiencing joy and regret and frustration and love and affection and guilt moment by moment, yet no one has analyzed these as emotions per se. And so that's what I decided to do. Okay, so here we are. We have mothers trying to find a way to meet these demands and manage the emotions when they inevitably fail to meet the ridiculous demands. What might be one way mothers could do this? Homeschooling, right? So that's um, how I see this happening, and this is what mothers told me. So let's start with the decision to homeschool. One of the things I asked mothers is what brought them to the decision to homeschool, which is the second most popular question that homeschoolers get, maybe a couple times a week. The first one is, what about socialization, right? Um, so why do you homeschool? I asked them, not really why, well, in another chapter I do, but, you know, how did you get there? And um, one of the things they really focused on was whether or not it was their preferred educational choice. And um, I really saw this as a unique way to sort of divide homeschoolers. Uh, I call them first choice homeschoolers and second choice homeschoolers. And what distinguished which group they ended up in, in, in my analysis, was their feelings about stay-at-home motherhood. So in going through the data, that's what I thought sort of distinguished them. So let's talk about first choicers. The majority of my sample, 19 out of 24 mothers, identified homeschooling as their first choice. They rarely sought alternatives for their kids. They homeschooled all of their children when possible. And they really reported a lot of what I call emotional epiphanies. So when I talk about the decision, they talk about their light bulb moment when they knew they were going to homeschool. So I further subdivide first choicers into two categories because of when they had this emotional epiphany and what it was about. One group of mothers, four out of the 19 first choicers, had their epiphany about stay-at-home motherhood. Um, they, at the birth of their first child, these women had planned to go back to work. The birth of their first child brought on, surprisingly for these mothers, intense feelings of attachment for their children. And they were, um, didn't want to go back to work. They suddenly had this epiphany, like, I can't leave this child every day. Um, and they experienced what another researcher, Bobel, has called shock shift stories. So this kind of experience is not unique to homeschoolers. It happens among different types of mothers. And they have this surprising emotional attachment to their child, and they shift their perspective, and they shift their lives, and they shift the focus because of this sudden sort of epip epiphany. Um, so I'll tell you about Judith. Judith is a homeschooler who I saw on a panel. The panel was recorded. That's how I got these data. Um, and she, her two children were in college at this time. And the person moderating the panel said, what brought you to homeschooling? What led you to homeschooling? And she said, what led me to homeschooling? I had a career that I really enjoyed and was very committed to. But when our son was born, I didn't anticipate the change that he would bring into my life. I knew that I could no longer commit to what I was doing in the workplace. I needed to make a shift. I know a lot of women that can do both, and I'm not one of them who can do a full-time job and parent. I'm just not made that way. Oh, so then she tells me, she, she tells everyone that she's in the hospital having the baby. Well, maybe not having the baby, but she recently had the baby. She calls her um, doctor, her, sorry, her boss from the hospital and says, I'm not coming back to work. She quits work in the hospital. That's how immediate it was for her. However, to be fully vested in the company's retirement plan, she had to stay at work for another 13 months. And she goes on to say, those are the most horrible 13 months of my life, to leave this little boy every day. I mean, my priorities shifted in 48 hours. So I did have some mothers sort of talk about this epiphany of, um, of motherhood, which 
And I think it's interesting that beyond repeating the question, she doesn't even talk about homeschooling. I edited this quote, but it's paragraphs before she gets to the reason she homeschooled. For her, it's about being with her child as a mother, right? So this is the focus here. Now, the second group of homeschoolers had their epiphany later in their mothering timeline, and it was about homeschooling. That was their light bulb moment. So most of my first choicers here uh, talked about it this way. These women had always known they had wanted to stay home, so when they had their babies, they weren't surprised at the intense emotional attachment. They didn't have to shift their perspective. Um, but when school came along, when their children approached school age, they couldn't bear to send them to school for various reasons, and I cover those in a different chapter. Um, but they couldn't bear to send, send them to school, and they started to experience like, some anxiety about this. And homeschooling, in some way, presented itself as the answer, and they had their light bulb moments, and that's how they knew that were, they were going to homeschool. So I'll tell you about Angela, who was sitting on the same panel as Judith. She had four children, and the moderator asked her, what led you to homeschooling? And she said, 13 years ago on a Sunday night, I was sitting there in church, and the message that night was, what does God want you to do? And I sat there pretty arrogant when I think back on it. I was thinking, well, I'm married, I think I'm a good wife, and I'm a stay-at-home mom. So what else could he want me to do? Now, the audience at the conference laughs. So I thought, I'm there. But the question never did leave me. It stayed in my heart. And not long after, I heard these two moms talking about homeschooling, and I had such a burst of enthusiasm within me. I stopped them. I said, how can you do that? How do you get involved? I tell you, there are days when I cry. There are days when I think, what am I doing? Did I really hear from God or what? But I keep going. My son, he's 14 now, has never been to school, and he thinks he's missing something. So he'll say, Mama, can I go to school? And I say, yes. When God releases me, you can go. The audience thought that was hilarious. Every so often, he'll say, did he release you yet? I'll say, not yet, not yet. And I'm hoping God doesn't release me, that we'll go all the way. So I think that this epiphany for her makes it not even a choice. She's a first choicer because there's no other choice for her. God has called her to do this, and even when she struggles, this is the only path that she sees and the right thing that she needs to be doing. So first choicers' emotional epiphanies I thought were really interesting. They cast them as maternal instinct, just knowing. They also they know in their hearts these kinds of things. But as a sociologist who studies emotions, we know that emotions don't occur in a vacuum. They occur um, in social situations. When we read the context, then we kind of try to understand what we're feeling and why we're feeling it. So as a sociologist, I say, yes, their emotions were definitely, these epiphanies, shaped by natural feelings, but also shaped by the gender and mothering ideologies that these women held or developed, and by structural constraints as well, like finances. And if you can't afford to homeschool, you're probably not going to have an epiphany that this is the only route for you. So I think epiphanies are interesting because they provide this emotional validation for mothers' desires and their choices and their actions. So let's talk about second choicers, who were far fewer in number in my sample anyway, but they were very noticeable in that these women often sought alternatives for their homeschooling. It was not their first choice. Um, homeschooling typically began for them with one of their children who had some kind of need that had to be uh, met, yet if they had other children, the other children were um, put into or, or were attending conventional programs, preschool or public school or private school or the, that kind of thing. And these women talked a lot about struggling with the commitment of staying at home. They didn't want to stay home with their school-aged children. So there are two reasons that this happened as well, two reasons for second choicers. One is the child's progress. So three of the five mothers talked about their children not fitting in a conventional academic environment. Sometimes this was due to developmental disparities. So uh, some, uh, say a child is very advanced, intellectu sorry, advanced intellectually, but sort of like behind socially, or can't be with sixth graders when they're 10 or something like that. Um, one woman told me her son had Asperger's syndrome, and he was gifted in, you know, academically, but would fall apart in the classroom by 1 o'clock because he couldn't handle the stimulation. And so he didn't qualify for an IEP because he was gifted, but he, did, he couldn't get in the gifted program because he couldn't function. And so she felt like the only thing she could do was homeschool him. So generally here, the conventional classroom is a poor fit, and these second choice mothers are trying to make it work for this one child. The other type of second choicers, um, homeschooled because of the husband's pressure on them. I only had two in my sample, but they really talked a lot about it. Husbands, they felt, these two women, felt their husbands pressured them either to stay out of the workforce, to embrace a version of motherhood where they stayed at home, um, or to homeschool. Renee, who was an ex-police officer who I talked to, had two children, and she told me um, 
I never thought I'd be at home. Homeschooling is very different from the adrenaline rushes of police work. You don't get the pats on the back like you do when you're wearing a badge. You get lots of accolades from the public, but it's almost like you're an invisible person when you're at home. My first couple of years at home, I probably should have been on antidepressants. So very different sort of emotional orientation to staying home with children than the first choicers. So the second choicers struggled. They talked about putting their careers on hold. They talked about having goals that they, they felt were you know, frustrated. Um, they didn't talk about epiphanies. They talked a lot about their choices to, to homeschool their kid, which I'll come back to. And they experienced quite a bit more emotional conflict than first choicers did. All right, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about time, emotions, and conflict. So we have these sort of uh, second choicers with more emotional conflict, first choicers with less. That's not to say that people didn't think that homeschooling was challenging, because all of the people I talked to had no problem naming the challenges of homeschooling when I asked them. Homeschooling intensifies time scarcity, and this was a source of um, emotional conflict for the mothers that I talked to. Um, many of them talked about role overload. So they are homemakers, and they are wives, and they are mothers, you know, with all the regular mothering duties, and now they're going to educate their children. And so this threatened to burn them out, and it threatened them with feelings of, quote, failure, because I'm not saying they're failing, but they said, you know, sometimes I feel like I can't achieve all of the things that I need to achieve. They also talked about the lack of me time, so this lack of personal time, and the emotions that came up around that were resentment and frustration. <clears throat> So when I looked at first choicers and second choicers with regard particularly to this personal time issue, um, first choicers saw the lack of personal time. They all wish they had more personal time, but first choicers saw this as a positive maternal sacrifice. So Sabrina, who had 12 children, explained to me the challenges of homeschooling, aside from 12 children. <laughs> would be like the obvious answer. Okay, so I said, what, you know, what are the challenges of homeschooling? And she said, I stay home every day. Being around them isn't so easy. Children are hard. Working on relationships is hard. It's so easy to put them on the bus and send them to school for the whole day and just say, that time is mine. Phew, they're gone. But what else was I going to do with my time? Hey, I could sit down and watch soap operas in the afternoon, but what better thing to do than to give it to your children? When I talked to second choicers about this very same issue, they said, you know, the, um, the loss of personal time, they saw it as more problematic than the first choicers, and they often connected it to feeling like they'd lost a sense of individual self, right, independent self. So Darlene, whose son had Asperger's syndrome, told me, I'm trying to resign myself to the fact that I might have to homeschool through high school. This has been hard for me. It's hard. It's hard as a woman to give up your own dreams for a while. I mean, they're sort of put on hold to raise your kids. So both of these women are saying, they're actually saying, it's hard, it's hard. But very different sort of um, conclusions come out of that and very different sort of connections to um, what they feel comfortable with. So they're all looking for personal time. How do they find it? So I asked them this, how do you seek personal time? Aside from just trying to get all your chores done, how do you find time for yourself? One of the places uh, homeschoolers sought personal time was from their husbands. So typically, this is certainly not with all husbands, but typically I heard many stories like this. A, w a mother would want to take a class or go to the gym or something like that, something with a scheduled personal time that she wanted every week. And she would say to her husband, you do the homeschooling. Every Wednesday from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, I need you to do math with the kids, right? So what tended to happen, certainly not in all cases, but what tended to happen is the mothers would then tell me these stories about how something came up. He forgot. He didn't do it well enough to her standards. And so these mothers would quickly relieve their husbands of this responsibility, and they would say, you know what? I still want that time, and you're just going to be with the kids. I don't care what you do with them, but you are on child care duty. So then mothers would tell me again, something came up, he forgot, this kind of thing. And so they couldn't find the reliable time. They couldn't make that time reliable. And so what they ended up doing is finding their personal time in the morning when children were still sleeping, 5.30, go to the gym, or in the evening when children were asleep. And in this case, dads just had to like be there to get the kids out if there's a fire, right? So he can be doing his own thing, and the kids are sleeping, and this is very not taxing on the dad, and it's very easy to accomplish, and this was the most reliable way, I call it the warm body approach, 
Um, and it certainly was not true for all dads. There was a, a range of differential support, you know, um, for moms. But I did hear many stories that sort of took this trajectory. So that's one place. They didn't often find personal time with husband's support. Oh, so one mom told me, one night a week from 9.30 to 11, I go to Barnes & Noble and read or balance the checkbook. I used to resent the kids being up 9 o'clock. It's my time. So here's the idea that the kids are sleeping. This is her time when the kids are sleeping. And she's used to resent it, right? So we have these problematic emotions that need to be managed. Another place they found personal time was they redefined it. So if you can make time mean something else, it can help. One thing that uh, when I would say, how do you find time for yourself, they'd say, oh, well, my kids are learning piano, and so I kind of learned some stuff too. It's pretty cool. So I feel like I'm like growing and evolving as a person because I'm doing things with my kids. Another thing they did was define me time as anything they did without their kids. <laughs> OK? <laughs> so um, I was talking to one mom, Renee, the ex-police officer, and she told me that she got me time while doing errands. And I said, Really? Grocery shopping is me time? <laughs> and she said, well, yes, it becomes that. It does. You just make those moments. For ages, I resisted getting a dishwasher because I learned to love washing the dishes by hand. Everyone knew to stay out of the kitchen while mom was doing the dishes. I'd have that 45 minutes to myself, and that was great. I said, Renee. <laughs> Really? Um, 45 minutes of household chores. We talked more about it. I got her to come around. Maybe she would have preferred a different kind of personal time. But I relate to this. As a parent, I relate to that, right? Who's going to fold the laundry? Me. I get to be in a room by myself watching TV. <laughs> you know? It, you make that time. So I thought it was really interesting. Here, homeschoolers are battling resentment, and they're willingly putting their own lives on hold. I put own life on hold in quotes because I had numerous people say, I've put my own life on hold. I've put my own life on hold, which really speaks to the degree of self-sacrifice that's going on here. And here's the thing I thought was interesting. How do you do it willingly? How do you fight that resentment? How? So what I discovered was that they were managing time subjectively. So Liz uh, really brought this to my attention when she just kind of offhandedly said in one of the interviews, motherhood is a season, there will be time for me later. And I remember just turning that over in my head time and time again, like time for me later, time for me later, how is that significant? And then I had my own epiphany, my own light bulb moment, which was, ah, they're changing the meaning of time. It's okay not to have any now because this is a bracketed time and I will have time later. That was really interesting to me and a really interesting way to manage emotions like resentment that might bubble up. So when I looked again at the data, how are mothers doing this? How are they changing the, the meaning of time? They use the emotions of nostalgia and regret to change their feelings and change their understanding um, of time. Keep going past my outline here. So they were really encouraged to savor the moment, the moment being like, you know, 25 years of child rearing, that moment. Um, so Judith, again, on the panel, her kids are in college, and she advised people, these kinds of things were all over the subculture, just relax and enjoy it, because now I wish I had that time back, right? Um, so with that, she starts telling this story to the panel about when her kids, how she, she dreaded art projects when her kids were little because of the mess, and she wished for the time when there was no more glitter. Like that was her like calling in life. I can't wait till there's no more glitter. Then she reached down into her purse and pulled out a vial of glitter to show the audience, and she said, I carry this around with me now to remind me of those times. I should have appreciated it more. So the lesson is, Childhood is fleeting. You're going to miss it. You should savor it, right? So these messages were very strong in the culture. I think they're very strong in mainstream culture as well to mothers in general. Um, and this is what helped mar uh, the women marshal the emotional resources to put their cells on hold for such prolonged periods. Cassandra, who had five children, told me the things she purposely thought about to achieve this sort of you know, state. She said, I'm going to be a little old lady someday, all alone with my memories. So I think about that. I don't yearn for that day, but I know it's coming. I try to appreciate what we have now, because it doesn't last very long at all in the great scheme of things. So I think that this probably applies to non-homeschooling mothers as well. And I wrote probably because I did not systematically analyze it. But in my everyday life, in my anecdotal experience, it applies to other mothers as well. So. Let's talk about first choicers and second choicers over time. 
<clears throat> how do they fare if they're doing all this like suppression of emotions and managing time in these ways? So by 2009, I went back and I interviewed the uh, 16 uh, homeschoolers that I could find from my original sample. Five of them had sent their kids to school during that gap since I had seen them. Interestingly, there's a divide again uh, with first choicers and second choicers. Of the first choicers, of the 12 first choicers I re-interviewed, two of them, 17%, had sent their kids to school. That's a small n, maybe the number's not significant. However, what's interesting is their stories about it. Both of them talked about significant financial strain, and both of them talked about their resentment about their financial situation and their unwillingness to send their kids to school. They're first choicers, so of course they're gonna be unwilling to send their kids to school, and they're gonna have to fight that resentment. When I talked to second choicers, three out of the four second choicers had sent their kids to school, at least at some point during that time, which is 75%. Again, a very small end, but if you look at their stories, it's strikingly different from the first choicers. Second choicers' stories are marked by this oscillation to school and back. Here's a conventional program that might work for my kid. Oh, it's not working back to homeschooling. I have one mom who told a story like, well, after I talked to you, he was in second grade. Then we sent him to school for third grade, and that was for six months. But then we brought him home, and then we tried again the next year. But then we homeschooled for three years, and then he went back. I mean, back and forth and back and forth. When kids found a uh, uh, fit, finally, sometimes the other child, because second choices, remember, started with one child, sometimes the other child would need to be homeschooled for like social reasons or that kind of thing, and so the mothers would pull them out. So their stories were just very um, much less, I don't want to say stable, because I don't want to imply that they were unstable, but much less solid, I guess, or, or homogenous than the other, uh, than the first choicers. So these moms talked a lot about being hopeful, but discouraged and fighting resentment as well. When I asked moms about their hopes for the future, second choicers talked about career goals right away. This is what I've been waiting to do. Here's where I'm going to go. Um, they said things like, I'm ready to focus more on me as an individual and my own needs. And they used a lot of choice rhetoric, sort of the rhetoric that kind of circulates in mainstream culture that uh, mothers tend to use. And they all said things like, have, they had no regrets. It was my choice, I have no regrets. So Darlene, whose son had Asperger's syndrome, um, she then later homeschooled her daughter. And then as her, her daughter finally entered into a conventional program, she told me, I said to my daughter, you must get your driver's license because of how busy you are. And this is how I phrased it, I need to get on with the next stage of my life. I wish I could be there more for her, and I'm trying to weigh that balance. All the time I put into homeschooling, that was a choice I made, and I don't regret it. The only regret I have is that I didn't personally, and this was my own choice, that I did not develop a, quote, career. But it's not too late. It's just now that I'm 53, it feels like I'm so out of date. So she's, you know, been putting her career on hold for quite some time, and she has a lot of feelings about that. First choicers, in contrast, talked a lot about family goals. Two did talk about work, but both of these women didn't consider it a career, and both of those women sort of scaled back on that work when their families needed them. And so uh, it was just a very different way that they talked about work. Uh, five of my 12 first choicers talked about looking forward to grandparenthood. None of my second choicers did. And three of the 12 had had more children since I last talked to them, and one was hopeful to have more children. So that was just a really interesting difference there. Cassandra, who had five children, told me, I would love to have more kids, but geez, I'm 46. I don't know how likely that is. Children are so beautiful. They're so wonderful to be around. I can't imagine saying I have enough. I see them as a blessing, and I wish I had more to give the world. I do, so maybe we'll adopt. Very different from saying, you got to get your driver's license. you got to be independent. i got to get out of here. <laughs> so we see that throughout all of these data, emotions and time influence maternal identities. So what kind of conclusions can we draw? What do homeschoolers tell us about the emotional culture of motherhood and about homeschooling in general? I think one of the conclusions is that um, they show us how we manage the emotions of motherhood. When we look at second choicers, and I didn't talk about it a ton here, but second choicers' use of choice rhetoric, um, choice rhetoric was sort of invented to validate women's choice in it's sort of the post-feminist period to decide to stay home or decide to work and sort of not be judged for that. Either of those is a totally equally valid choice. Um, 
it's interesting from my data that using that rhetoric is accompanied with people having a lot of emotional conflict. And I think it's because you can choose poorly. Um, the more choices you have, the, more, the harder it is to choose. And what if you don't choose the right thing? First choicers and their emotional epiphanies kind of escaped this emotional conflict. The epiphanies really provided certainty and emotional validation for their mothering identities. I would call it a choice, but they didn't see it as a choice. They saw it as the path that they were going to pursue. And this is accompanied with, you know, much less emotional conflict, which facilitates this long-term intensive involvement with their children. It was their, their stories were less bumpy. It was easier for them. It was still hard, but it was easier for them emotionally um, throughout their journey. So I think the, one of the implications here is that when we try to expand the box of acceptable mothering practices, like by using choice rhetoric and this kind of thing, um, may, maybe it actually doesn't. Um, it might not work very well to manage the difficult emotions of motherhood. Why might this be? What might be one of the factors? And I think one of the factors is that we define intensive mothering as a time-sensitive identity. We believe mothering has an endpoint, um, and it's because of the way we construct the idea of motherhood. It's a particular type of motherhood. When children leave the nest, we're kind of like, well, it's over. You're still a mother, but that mothering activity, the intensive activity, is over. And so I think this affects the emotional culture of motherhood by putting sort of that, um, it's, it's like a limited time offer, right? And it adds this urgency to it. So a lot of times I would be like analyzing this data, I'd be sitting in my office and my kids would be in daycare and I'd be like, oh my God, I'm like the worst mother ever. Look at all these people talking about how much time they spend with their kids and here I am stuck in my office, I'm missing it, right? Um, when we put this time sensitive identity sort of um, on motherhood and then we connect it to sort of the emotions, it helps us suppress the discontent that we may feel and it helps us um, sacrifice much of our time, much of our independent selves, um, and this doesn't work for everybody. It works for some people, but it doesn't work for everybody, and so it's kind of, it creates a bit of a narrow box. Um, I think the real problem is that what we're doing is, def and other people have said this, defining motherhood as a choice between self and children. Because of the ways that we have defined it, we have to, working is seen as a choice for self, um, and staying home is seen as a choice for children. Giving up yourself is for your children, but that means giving up yourself, right? So anyway, um, those are some of my conclusions, and uh, I'd be happy to take some questions or comments. Thanks. Oh, microphone, right. Thanks, Jen. Um, my question is just, uh, you talked about the ones that had the epiphany and that it was an emo, you talked about them having, realizing this emotional attachment to the child that sort of rose up in those 48 hours. To what extent do you think it was an emotional attachment to the child versus an emotional reaction to the idea that now they were in a new status as a mother and that it was really just, that they were feeling something about themselves rather than an attachment to the child? That's a good question. Um, Rick's a sociologist, so. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny because these mothers are telling me these stories like, oh, I was so surprised by, you know, feeling attached to my child or whatever. And so I was interviewing this one mother, and she told me how she had this job interview, and she went to the interview, and she, all she could think about was her child, and she went home from the interview, and she grabbed her child, and she was like crying, and she didn't want to work, and all stuff. And I said, did those feelings take you by surprise? <laughs> And she looked at me like I had two heads and was like, who are you? What do you mean did they take me? And it was very awkward. What do you mean did they take me by surprise? When you say that, it's like I didn't have emotions or something. And I was like, well, no, it's sociological. It's interesting. Um, but she, you know, it was, it was very, I offended her by saying that. And so I don't know if they really had feelings, if it was hormones from childbirth, if it was like, wow, I'm in this new social role and there's all these sort of emotional responsibilities, but they reported it as these are my feelings. I didn't expect to feel this and now I do. So it's, and it's interesting because the mothers who said they had, they were surprised by their emotional attachment to their kids talked about how it was for them. Whereas the mothers, like the one I offended, said, um, you know, talked about it in more universal terms. And actually she said to me, do you have children? 
<laughs> and I didn't. And I said, oh, no. And she said, well, you, you'll never know until you have children. It's not something I can explain. This is a natural feeling, and there's no other way to know, um, which I think there's, a, there's some truth to that. Because like, now that I'm a mom, I can go, oh, I can see how you would say that, right? Because there is no other way to know 100%. But you could imagine. So um, the first choice and second choice moms, uh, why, what explains that? Is there anything in your, let's say, the demographics you look at that would, let's just say, are the first choice ones more, more Christian and more conservative, and the second choice tend to be more the, the not so much? Or Yeah, yeah. They tend to be that way, but it's not a, 100%. So there were some sort of... Um, the majority of first choicers also held these kind of other gender ideologies um, that sometimes were consistent with maybe their faith. So like uh, conservative Christian or evangelical Christian, wh where their understandings of their role as mothers was very closely tied to staying at home, right? So that was a portion of those first choicers. Um, but there was also some mothers who were more well, to, to say it how one of my uh, subjects said it, more on the granola end, right? So more on the hippie granola end, who were like all about gender equality and feminism and this kind of thing, but also were first choicers in much the same way. So I think that having a pre-established ideology going into it because of your faith enhances that. But there were also um, some folks who identified as fundamentalist Christians who were second choicers and did not want to stay home. So it wasn't a perfect correlation, but there were those tendencies. The book seems to indicate that uh, most of the mothers will survive, but beyond the book, what about the students? How would, any idea, how do they compare with the ones who go to school? Well, that's a tough question because you really can't compare the two populations, right? So we n will never know how homeschoolers would have done individual kids had they gone to school, right? Because the conditions, it's not a controlled experiment. So there are a lot of studies that show that homeschooled kids do just fine. And many studies show that homeschooled kids actually outperform kids in conventional schools, public schools particularly. However, you can't disentangle all the other effects there. So it could be that parents who are really concerned about their kids' education. So the stereotype of homeschoolers is they don't care about their kids' education. They pull them out of school when the opposite is true. They're very concerned about their kids' education and they want to take charge of it. So you don't know, is it the parents' like focus on education? Is it socioeconomic status? What are the things that bias those two samples? So it's really hard to, you can't really compare, but the evidence does show that homeschooling is a perfectly legitimate option for many kids, and many kids do very well. You, and people always say, well, what about socialization, right? Um, you can go to a public school and see beautifully socialized kids and horribly socialized kids, and you can go to the homeschool community and see the same thing, you know? So, um, you know, there's this stereotype like, oh, homeschool kids are this way, or they're weird, or they don't know how to interact with people, and that was not <coughs> my um, impression at all, by and large, in the, in the population. So it's an interesting question. I wish I could answer it. They do just fine, generally. So to piggyback on, on this gentleman's question, so what about the perception of from the mothers on how they were doing, A, with teaching, but also how their kids were actually learning? So like when I ask them, you know, how do you know homeschooling is working, that kind of thing? It's hard to tell because like how accurate their perceptions were. So all I can do is say, hey, what do you think? And talk about their perceptions. Um, because I didn't evaluate the kids or anything. But mothers would often um, use very conventional standards to legitimate the unconventional um, choice to homeschool. So they would say, well, my kid took the SATs and got this score, which would be a really good score. My kid, um, or my kid took the SATs and didn't do well, but we realize it's because we haven't trained our child in standardized testing, right? So, you know, which you could, as a, as a public school parent, you could say those same things, you know, like, oh, what's the first test? How are they supposed to know how to take a test? Or they're not good test takers or, or those kinds of things. So generally, though, they talked about academic achievement or their occupations if the kids were older. Um, they said things like, you know, um, when my kids got to their job, they had coworkers coming up saying, 
how did you get to be so, so self-motivated? How are you so high at such a young age? And the kids, and the, so the parents would say, it was homeschooling. Hard to know because we didn't do the thing that you didn't do, but um, generally, in my experience meeting homeschooled kids in my classes, they tend to be very self-motivated. But those are the ones who go to college or in my class and self-identify to me. Um, so, I, you know, they seem to be very capable. But moms, moms were concerned with that and they were also concerned with talking about how well socialized they were. Do they have healthy relationships with their friends and that kind of thing? Um, which I think are all very conventional measures to justify an unconventional choice. Does that answer your question? Uh, the other thing that I was thinking was um, if, the, if the mother um, wasn't her 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 sense of self as like a teacher you know as far as her perception if she felt more successful like if the if the kids were learning more or if you saw that also she was um really just focused on well no matter what i'm i'm keeping like the the idea that they're keeping out of some keeping the kids out of something that might be detrimental versus doing something that's actually really good for their their kid and how does that play into their sense of being a successful mother and a teacher because those things are now going hand in hand okay yeah i gotcha yes there was um, a lot of discussion about you know oh we started homeschooling and it was going great and then we hit a wall and my kid wouldn't do anything and locked herself in the room and was slamming doors and you know and this really affected mothers because they felt like what if i've made the wrong choice what if I'm not doing it right? What if I'm ruining my child? There was a lot of anxiety about ruining your child because that's what critics are telling them. You know you're gonna ruin your child. You know, I'm not, I don't think, but maybe I am. You know, like it, 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 there, it was very difficult, I think, those moments for them. Um, I heard one woman speak on a panel and she listed like 10 things that went, quote, wrong in her family. She said, we've had, she said she, she, when she started homeschooling, she envisioned her children wearing their handmade dresses in the backyard, growing their own food for the poor, and singing Bible hymns or something like that, you know. And she said, what I got was, uh, you know, tattoos, piercings, uh, uh, unwed pregnancy, uh, you know, la, la 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 the alcoholism, drug use, you know. She named all of these things that are problems of adolescence. But she said, I would homeschool again because of my relationship with my children. So just different ways to... And you don't know what would have happened anyway, so maybe it would have been worse. Mick is up there. Do you want to go to that microphone? They want you to use a microphone. Did you speak much with the mothers about their expectations and experiences post K through 12 education, like more towards college? Hmm. It depends. Some moms had older kids along the timeline, so I did talk a little bit about that. Um, kids who had jobs and sort of got through school and that kind of thing. Is it, what else is here? What are you thinking? Did they expect? Um, like, did they have expectations if they would live at home until a certain point or what, ty what type of college they would go to? Um, there were different levels of expectation with respect to college. If the parents went to college, generally they expected the kids to, and it was sort of a problem if the kids were not showing interest in that. I didn't have that many kids going to college. My sample was kind of small, so then it's just a subsample of that. I didn't look at that too closely, but they did talk a little bit about that. And they didn't, you know, they didn't live with, the, I didn't talk to anyone whose kids lived with them until they were 30. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the fear, the boomerang generation or whatever. Is this one on? Oh, yeah. Um, so it's interesting that it's this theme of all these people asking you questions about the kids, and that's what I want to ask about too. So I, I think you're going to be mad at me, but I think there's a follow up book uh, <laughs> that you can write. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am curious about uh, to what extent. Did your, the people that you talked to talk about the, their relationships with their kids? How much was that a motivating factor? And kind of related to that, how much did, um, I guess, how much of the decision to homeschool was about kind of the ability to kind of control the environment to a certain extent or like to, to do what they, kid, they could to, um, 
kind of have, I don't know, how much do they want their kids to follow in their footsteps? Do the kids want to homeschool? I guess I kind of, I don't know if I can package those all as one question, but. Mm -hmm. Well, the relationship with their children is one of the primary motiva motivations to homeschool. Um, and a lot of people talk about that. And despite all of those 10 problems that one woman had, that's the thing that makes her a success, is the relationship she has with her kids. And because it's such a decision about family, and there's so much um, you know, family motivation going into it, I think that that's a, a really big part of it. I kind of forgot the rest of your question. Do the kids want to homeschool? A lot of people talked about how their kids do want to homeschool. Most people reported that their kids were very happy homeschooling. So the kids who's, who's like, mom, can I go to school? That was fairly unusual. Sometimes kids went through, a lot of parents told me the ki what the kids wanted to do, they thought they were missing, they wanted to ride a school bus. That was the only thing they thought they were missing about school. And so we went down and we rode the city bus around and that got that out of her system and she never wanted to go to school after that. So parents said things like that. They did want to control the environment. I think a lot of parents want to control the environment, you know? Um, and so one of the things that homeschoolers were concerned about is the social environment at, at conventional school, is the you know, values they're going to learn from other kids, sometimes from the curriculum. So I had parents on the very conservative end saying, we don't agree with these things that the school is teaching, and parents on the very liberal end going, oh my god, this school teaches no critical thinking, you know, and very critical of that part of it. So you get people on the ends not wanting to move toward the middle, and those end up being homeschoolers. So the control was really big, but I don't think I don't think that's unique to homeschoolers. Did you have any information on these mothers' uh, lives growing up with, and their relationships with their parents and whether that played any role in their decisions? Not really. Not really. I didn't talk to any parents who were homeschooled themselves, but it, it really didn't really take off till the 80s, so that's probably a cohort effect or something. Related to that question, did... Um the choice rhetoric that the mothers made to stay home with their children and homeschool them, did they have any expectations that their daughters would also do the same thing? Hmm. Did, it, did their choice limit or somehow affect the choice of their daughters moving because forward? Because of the gender roles involved? Hmm. I would have to think about that. I think people talked about wanting their kids to homeschool regardless of gender, but I would have to look and see if there was an expectation, like, I hope my son's wife homeschools, you know, that kind of thing. I don't really know. That's a good question. It would have been something to look at before I published the book. <laughs> um, kind of playing on what they were asking, uh, I personally was brought up homeschooled and with public school. And before I even knew I was going to have children, I always assumed if I did that I would do some combination of that. So I was wondering if because we're going into this next generation, do you think there might be a third group of people besides the first choicers and second choicers, kind of like a preconceived choice, where it's not even a choice. It's just an assumption like sending a child to a public school that might be worth investigating. Maybe. Yes. You write that book, Third Choicers, The Next Generation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think a lot of people just replicate what they were brought up with. You know, um, and so, yeah, that's a really good point. People, we might start seeing the preconceived choice. I like how you put that. It's a good point. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to close down here. It's, it's 8 o'clock. So thank you again for, for coming and your very interesting and engaged questions. And thank you, Jen, for, for a very great uh, talk. And, and hopefully we'll see you all next quarter. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.